Joe knows taxes. Joe knows the market. Joe knows social security. Joe knows income planning. Joe knows pickleball? No. This is Joe Knows Retirement. Oh man, do I love that intro. And yes, I do not know pickleball. I don't play pickleball, uh, but I know a lot about retirement. So I'm glad you're tuning in here today. And we are going to talk about today the three tax buckets when it comes to your investments. So we're going to talk about the three ways your investments could be taxed. And we're going to categorize them into showing you which are those three categories. And so there's the taxable bucket, there's the tax deferred bucket, and there's the tax free bucket. And so we're going to break down each one. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of each one. And then we're going to talk about just, you know, where should we have all of our money? Is there a best bucket to have it? Or do we want a balance of all three? Or do we want one overweighted and the other's not? So that's what we're going to talk about here today. And I wrote about this in my book called I Hate Taxes, Lower Your Taxes, Own Your Retirement. So if you have not gotten a copy of that book, Look in the description below or go ahead and text us or go to our website and you can actually request one. We'll be glad to send you one. Our goal in writing this book was just really to help as many people as possible pay less in taxes throughout their retirement. We just saw that too many people are not planning for this. Too many advisors are not talking about it. CPAs aren't talking about tax planning. They're just talking about tax prep. So we felt an obligation of like, all right, we need to make sure people understand this. So that's one of the reasons why we do this podcast, YouTube, why we do uh, just so many workshops and webinars is to really relay the information that people need to know because we don't need Uncle Sam taking more money than his fair share from our pockets every year. We work way too hard for our money. Let's make sure that we can protect what we've worked hard for. So let's first start off here with these tax buckets talking about that taxable investment. So with that taxable investment, this could be those investments that are non-qualified. So this could be anything outside of those retirement accounts that we've, we're going to talk about next. This is going to be maybe that single registered, that joint registered, that transfer on death account. Maybe it's a title as a trust. And maybe this is an Apple stock that you bought a long time ago. And maybe you put $10,000 in Apple stock and maybe now it's worth $100,000. And so typically when you look at this type of scenario, what happens when you sell Apple stock in that scenario is you have to pay capital gains tax. So most of the vehicles in this taxable investment are going to be at capital gains rates, which for most people is 15%, but it's actually depending on where you sit. That could actually be 0%, it could be 15%, it could be 20%. It's all based on your income. And so if you have a higher income, you're gonna be at that 20%. If you have a lower income, then you could actually sell off that capital gain at 0%. So let me tell you a story about this guy with Apple stock. I'm going to talk about a couple different options we could have done with him. But one option is he was retired. He, so he just retired. He no longer had any income coming in. He no, he hadn't started Social Security. He hadn't started his pension. So his taxable income was actually zero. And so as you all know, there's something called the standard deduction, which is almost about $30,000. And so for him, he could sell off $30,000 of Apple stock at 0% tax rate no matter what. And then after that $30,000, he actually has about another 90,000 before he reaches that 15% capital gains rate. So he could technically sell off about $120,000 of Apple stock and not pay any taxes. So as I shared, he put in 10,000, that was his cost basis, but if he sold it for 100,000, he could have only $90,000 gain, but if he sold it this year and that year alone, he wouldn't have to pay any taxes on all of that growth he's seen out throughout the years. Now, if he would have sold this last year while he's working, he would have been in the 15% bracket. If he would have sold it next year when all of his income starts coming in in retirement, he would have had to pay 15% capital gains rate. So that's how smart planning can really help you in this type of bucket here. Another strategy that we could have looked at for him is something called a donor advice fund. So let's say he never had that year of lower income. And so if he could, if he was charitable minded, we could have given that $100,000 Apple stock to a donor advice fund in just one year. And if we would have done that, he would have removed all of that appreciation and growth because if you give that to a donor advice fund, it's technically a charity and you don't have to pay capital gains tax if you give it to a charity and when it's sold. And so that was how that would work. 
Now with a donor advised fund, you have to give it to a charity if it goes to there, and but you don't have to give it that one year. So for him, he was given $10,000 to a charity every year, so we put $100,000 in his donor advised fund for him to give $10,000 a year over time. The difference is, is we were able to itemize deductions for this year, and then we were able to take the standard deduction moving forward. So remember, the standard deduction is about 30,000 right now, it's really hard to get over that standard deduction. If you're only given $10,000 a year, you may not be able to itemize. Majority of people won't take the standard deduction now. And typically what we're seeing is charitable deductions aren't seeing any fruit. They're not seeing any tax savings fruit. Um, don't get me wrong, they're seeing fruit from a charitable standpoint, but they're not seeing any tax savings is what we're seeing right now. And it's actually driving charitable, charitable gifts down, which is not necessarily the best thing, but there's a way around it and the donor advice fund is one strategy. And so not only could we have removed that appreciation at 0%, but we also could have had a huge deduction this year to do more tax planning. So we could have had a $100,000 deduction that we could offset a Roth conversion or we could offset taking out more money from our investments or we could offset you know, the sale of a rental property, whatever it may be. Now we have more leverage there in the type of planning that we're doing. So that's what some of the things in the taxable investment. The other thing to understand is there's other vehicles in this bucket here. There's things like a, uh, you know, like if you sell a rental property, that's typically gonna be at capital gains rates. Um, if you have, um, other assets that you sell, it could be a capital gains. Something that, you know, if you have real estate, there's a lot of planning opportunities out there for you. Um, one thing is to understand if you sell a personal residence that up to $250,000 is exempt of capital gains if you're single and up to 500,000 is exempt if you're married. So most people selling a house are not necessarily gonna have to worry about paying capital gains on that, which is a nice little benefit that we get um, with that. Now, if you're selling a rental property, you wanna be very careful about what you do there when you sell it. There's a lot of different strategies. There's some strategies out there called an installment sale where you could look to you know, divvy up that gain over a certain amount of years could make sense. We've done that for clients. Or maybe you look at something like a charitable remainder trust, which is a lot more advanced, but it can be very uh, advantageous depending on how much gain you have in that type of you know, real estate or non-qualified investment, whatever it may be. But in this type of, uh, or if maybe you're selling your business could be another idea, right? But the way this works is that, you know, let's say you're um, selling a non-qualified asset. Basically, you would put into a trust. And since you're going to put into a trust, you get all the tax savings today. Now, if you do a, CR, you know, a charitable remainder trust, you're basically giving up ownership of this investment. Although you can still get income paid to you every single year for the rest of your life. So what, how this works basically is that you get this big deduction up front, you get an income over time, but this big deduction up front is going to allow you to do a lot of different tax planning strategies now and take advantage of things. And then once you get your income for life, once there's something left or whatever's left, that just has to go to the charity. But if that's your goal anyways, it could be a really neat way to set it up and you can save lots of money through a charitable remainder trust and get a lot of tax benefits. So those are just some different ideas, some more advanced strategies. If you have a lot of money and non-qualified and you're not getting help, <clears throat> I would tell you you're probably missing opportunities. There's so many different opportunities there. There's so many sack saving strategies. You just want to make sure you have someone know what to look for because if you don't know, that could be a problem. So those are some of the things to look at in that tax bucket, that taxable bucket. Now, with that taxable bucket, <clears throat> before we move on to the tax deferred bucket, I do want to talk about um, there's some type of investments like a CD or a treasury bond or you know just any type of investment where you have to pay ordinary income on the growth of that. That may be considered in the taxable bucket, but that's not going to be at capital gains. It's actually going to be at ordinary income every year that that's going to come due or whenever that interest is coming through. So just understand the difference of that. And typically what we see, if we see clients with, let's say, a non-qualified asset, we typically want to see that invested in something that's going to be subject to capital gains versus something that's at ordinary income. And the reason why is because capital gains are more favorable. For example, would you rather pay a 22% ordinary income rate or a 15% capital gains rate? So just by structuring your investments in either way is how the tax treatment is going to be. And so maybe what we'd look to do, maybe you really like the idea of a CD or treasuries. Well, maybe we own that in our tax deferred vehicle and we own the stock market in our non-qualified so we can get the, non, the tax, capital gains treatment and then we can get the ordinary income on the tax deferred, which is how it is already. So those are just some advanced ideas to think about that if that's you. 
So that's that taxable bucket there. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and transfer over to the tax deferred bucket. Now with the tax deferred bucket, this is going to be all that money you saved all these years, the 401ks, the IRAs, the 403b, the TSP, Ohio deferred comp if you're in Ohio, or maybe you're in a different state and you have a different type of deferred comp there. And so if that's you, what happens when you take out money from those accounts? You got to pay taxes and that's why it's called tax deferred. So you put in $10,000 up front, you get a tax savings today and you're pushing your tax burden to the future. So let's say that this 10,000 grows to 100,000 and then you take out 100,000. Well, now you've got to pay taxes on all of that 100,000. So you save on 10, but you pay on 100. And I typically joke with people and say, is that a good deal? Um, and so typically people say, no, that's not a great deal. And so what we have to understand with this tax deferred investment is that Uncle Sam is our owner on this investment until we either kick him out or he forces us to take the money out and that is at either age 73 or 75 called required minimum distribution. And that is when the government comes and gets their share of everything that we have not paid taxes into yet. And so with that being the case, we need to make sure we're planning for that so Uncle Sam gets the least out of that. Now, I often joke with people and say, hey, is this the worst bucket you can have? You know, you save on 10, but you got to pay in 100. Like that's, that doesn't sound very fun. And I actually tell people it's actually a really good place to have your money if you've if you've done it the right way. So think about it. You know, in the 1970, for example, highest tax rate was about 70 percent. Well, the highest bracket today is only 37 percent. And so the question you have to ask is that, hey, let's say that you were in the highest bracket. You know, not everyone is, but let's just use that as an example. You could defer at 70 percent, not pay 70 percent so that you could pay it today at 37 percent. That's a good deal, isn't it? And so that's why I'm telling you, if you've done this tax deferred, you've probably made the right decision. But my question to you is, are you making the right decision today? Do you think tax rates will be higher or lower than they are now? If you think they're going to be higher, why would we continue to defer this investment to the future when they're higher? Wouldn't you rather pay them when they're lower versus later when they're higher? That's the whole idea that we're talking about with this type of investment. So um, that's the tax deferred. We'll come back to that, but let's go ahead and move forward to the tax-free bucket here. The tax-free bucket is going to consist of many different types of investments. Most people are popular with the, you know, or know about the Roth IRA or the Roth 401k or the Roth 403b. These are those investments that work opposite of the tax deferred. So what that means is when you put your $10,000 in up front, you don't get a tax deduction. But when that 10,000 grows to 100,000 and you take out 100,000, you don't have to pay any taxes on that money. It's all tax free. All that growth is tax free and it's all tax free when you take it out. It does not count as federal income. It's not going to count towards your, your federal income brackets. And so it's, it's technically tax free there. And so that's how that tax free bucket works for those Roth accounts. Um, some other tax free vehicles are life insurance. So with life insurance, it could be tax-free in a multitude of ways. One way could be a tax-free death benefit. So if you pass away, your beneficiary could receive that death benefit tax-free. So for example, let's say you put in a couple dollars and now it's spitting out you know, hundreds of dollars. Well, that hundreds of dollars would be tax-free. You wouldn't have to pay any tax on any of that growth and it would all be tax-free. So that's how the life insurance works. It could also be used tax-free for long-term care. We see people have used that recently, um, especially knowing that Long-term care insurance rates have gone up. And so, you know, not everyone loves the concept of paying for something they may not need, especially knowing how expensive it can be. And so a lot of people looked at life insurance as being that dual-edged sword where they could use it for long-term care if they needed to, but they could also use it for, you know, the death benefit they pass, or they could, you know, cancel it and take any cash value out or anything like that. So just more more, more different types of ideas with, with life insurance there. You could also use life insurance for tax-free income. This is one that I'm not personally the biggest fan of. Um, it could work. It's, I've seen it work for some. But for those who are in or near retirement, who are older and the cost of insurance is a little higher, you know, the cash value is probably not going to grow as much. You're not going to be able to take as many, as much tax-free loan out from that to be really, really beneficial. Um, not to say it can't work. I'm just saying that we just typically don't use that a ton with our clients. And if you do have someone that's trying to push that on you, just understand they may be an insurance salesperson and just understand how they get paid if they do that product um, would be my only advice. Again, not to say it's bad, just make sure you, you've got your antennas up um, with something like that. So that's how that um, works with the tax-free. There's also another opportunity called a health savings account. 
and that's one of my personal favorite investments. This is one of the first investments I put money into every year. This is what we call the trifecta. So as you know, I played basketball in, in high school and college, and I was a three-point shooter. So I always said three is better than two, right? And so it's the same concept with an HSA. When you put your money in up front, it's tax deferred. You get a tax savings, and then it's tax deferred growth. You don't pay any tax on any of the growth. And then when you pull it out for healthcare expenses and retirement, there's no taxes with it. And so notice how I said in retirement because typically we wanna see people wait to take from their HSA as long as possible to get all of that tax-free growth. And we typically wanna seek, seek more growth in those types of investments so we can get all of those benefits of tax-free. And that's typically what we do when we look at these three buckets is we typically wanna get seek more growth in our tax-free bucket than our tax-deferred. Maybe our tax-deferred is gonna be more of our conservative type investments so that as that money grows, it's not gonna be as much growth, which means it's not gonna be as much more tax to us um, ongoing. It's not gonna be more tax to us ongoing is ultimately the idea. So those are the three buckets looked at from the pros and cons of each and how they all work. So I always ask people, if you had a magic wand, where do you want all your money? And of course, everyone says tax-free. And there's a couple of thoughts there. One is, where do you think most people have all their money? Well, right now there's nearly $40 trillion in the tax-deferred bucket. In the tax-free, in the Roth, there's less than a trillion is what people say. And so there's way more money in tax-deferred, but everyone wants it in tax-free. So why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. There's been a lot of limitations on the tax-free investment. Uh, hasn't been around forever. Roth IRAs didn't exist until 1997. Roth 401ks didn't exist until 2006. And so you've been limited for the amount of years. Although there is some strategies you can do today that majority of people can do and one of these strategies is called a Roth conversion. And that's where you take money from that tax deferred bucket I talked about, that middle bucket, and you move it over to the tax free. Now, is it that easy? Well, no, of course not. You've got to pay taxes on that money right now. Now, the question I ask people is, do we want to pay taxes right now? Well, yeah, because tax rates are on sale right now. I talk about this in the book, I Hate Taxes, right? Where I, I talk about these three buckets and I talk about the fact that tax rates are most likely going up and so we need a plan now before they go up. Would you rather pay the tax now at lower rates or later at higher rates? It's kind of like that Fram oil filter commercial. I don't know if you any of you remember that. He goes, would you rather pay me now or pay me later? And he talks about, hey, you can buy a $4 Fram oil filter today and all your problems are solved or you can wait and not do anything and pay $200 for me to fix this problem because we know it's gonna happen. And so would you rather pay $4 or $200? And then he looks at the camera and he says, shrugs his shoulders, he says, the choice is yours. And I think that's the same thing that Uncle Sam's saying to us. He's saying, you can, you can pay your taxes now by a Roth conversion and strategies like that. Or you can just wait and pay me later when I you know, increase everyone's taxes because we're so much trillion dollars in debt right now and we've got more interest on our debt than we have revenue coming in, I mean, what do you think is gonna happen? You think they're gonna reduce spending? Well, they could, and that would help, but most people suggest taxes have to rise. And so that's what we're looking at here with the tax buckets. So um, back to my thought of where do we want all of our money? Well, most people would say all their money is tax-free, but I'd actually probably not say that's the case. We typically want our clients to have a balance. So think about it this way. Do you have all your money in Bitcoin? Of course not. You've got all your investments diversified in all these different buckets. And that's typically what we'd want to see. Now, from a tax planning standpoint, when you look at your money and you look at these three buckets, where's all your money at? It's probably not all in tax-free, right? It's mostly in tax-deferred. Most of you have all your money in 401ks and IRAs. And so if that's the case, when you take out money from those, you got to pay taxes. And you really have all your money in one place, just like Bitcoin, you would have all your place in one place. So if you need $50,000 in retirement, where are you gonna go to get it? You're gonna go to tax deferred. And my question is, what tax rate are you gonna have to pay on that eventually? And you're not gonna have an option because do you choose tax rates or does Uncle Sam choose tax rates? So you have no choice in how much you're gonna have to give away to your partner, Uncle Sam, if all your money's in that tax deferred bucket. So typically what we wanna see is a balance. Now, we don't want to just move everything to tax-free because that would give us a heart attack and we'd have to pay the highest tax brackets in doing so. And so we typically want to move enough to take advantage of lower rates, but not too much to where we're paying more taxes than what we would expect to pay in the future. So there's really a science, there's a calculation to deciding how much you should Roth convert, but also deciding how if you should or not. Um, but those are some of the, the ideas there. And then there's also some strategies with that taxable bucket we talked about earlier that you could start looking to reposition some of that money 
into the tax deferred or tax free bucket by contributing to a Roth IRA each year, right? By contributing that uh, that that uh, that allowable amount each year, or maybe you contribute to a Roth 401k or maybe a 401k. You look to take some of that money and max out your accounts. Even if your income is not as high, maybe you've got some saved up, maybe we'll reposition it instead of paying capital gains tax on it. Maybe we can move it to a Roth IRA where now it grows tax free. So we do that with a lot of our clients. Um, it's just a way to be tax smart and pay pay least amount of taxes uh, moving forward there. Uh, or on these Roth conversions, right? You have to pay the taxes now. Maybe we'll pay the taxes out of our non-qualified investments, our taxable investments, so that we can get more over to the Roth. IRA. So um, anyways, that's how the breakdown works for the three tax buckets. There's a lot of planning involved on deciding how much you need in each bucket. And again, I want to make it very clear. I'm not trying to give specific advice today. I'm just trying to give you general education. You really need to work with a professional who understands how tax planning works so you know how much to put in each bucket for your specific case. And I believe that if you structure these buckets the right way, you'll be able to save hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes over time if you've been a diligent saver. Because the more money you have, the more money you have to save in tax planning. And so that would be my biggest advice for you is make sure you get help. If your advisor's not talking about this, find an advisor that does. If your CPA is not talking about this, don't get mad at them because they do tax prep. They don't do tax planning. It's important to work with a team so that they can look at all of this for you to make sure you have things structured in the right position. And also understand too, is if your goal is to leave money behind, to leave a legacy, then estate planning is extremely important. And when we think of an estate planning, we think about what is a beneficiary going to get from these investments, not actual get, but how much are they actually going to be able to take out after taxes are play a part here. And so, for example, if you left your beneficiaries money in the tax free, they're going to get all of that. If you leave the money in the tax deferred, but an IRA, for example, now they have to take it out in 10 years. If it's a non-spouse and they're younger, right now, they're going to have to take it out in 10 years and they're probably going to increase their tax brackets, which means they may not have as much of an estate left to them if that's your goal. So that's why these three buckets don't even come in handy while you're living and getting income and in retirement, but also and leaving a benefit and leaving an inheritance. So make sure you're, you're really up to speed on these three buckets. Um, and if you're doing it yourself and you don't feel confident or you're looking for someone else to help, make sure you reach out to someone. If you are looking for our help, go ahead to our website, peakretirementplanning.com. There's a place you can apply to talk to us and we'll be sure to give you some guidance. If we can't help you moving forward, at least make sure we can direct you to someone who can uh, because that's our goal is to make sure we can influence as many people to live that retirement that they dreamed of. So hopefully you enjoy this episode of Joe Knows Retirement and we will see you on the next one. Since we do not know your specific situation, None of this information can serve as tax, legal, insurance, or financial advice and may be outdated or inaccurate. The information comes from sources believed to be reliable but cannot be guaranteed. This content is prepared for educational purposes only. If you need advice, please contact a qualified CPA, attorney, insurance agent, financial advisor, or the appropriate professional for the subject you would like help with. Peak Retirement Planning, Inc. is an Ohio-based registered investment advisor and able to offer advisory services in Ohio and in other states where registered or exempt from registration.